Welcome back, all you fellow still figuring it outers. I am excited for this episode. If you're like me and so many people all around the world, you have been paying attention to the Olympics. The Olympics, the 2020 Olympics, which has not helped me keep up with what year it actually is, but it has helped me to stay inspired by so many stories of people who have dedicated their lives waiting for this moment to compete on such a huge stage. And so you you hear these different stories, these side stories, you get to find out more about some of these people and, and their ups and downs, and there's uh, there's always ups and downs. And so I'm excited today because I get to share uh, the story or part of the story of uh, a friend of mine named Brandon who is a professional runner and who was competing to be at the Olympics uh, this year. He did not quite make it, but he has overcome more than probably any other runner. Uh, that, that may be hard to say, but uh, definitely in regards to the amount uh, of this particular surgery that he had, uh, he has come back from the amount, from an incredible amount of adversity. And so I'm excited to share this conversation with you uh, for us to be inspired, not just by him uh, figuring out how to overcome a crazy amount with, with running, but really how to stay grounded mentally and spiritually, how to, to not r- get your identity wrapped up so much in just one thing. Uh, but really how to be your best uh, all around. And he he gives us some really practical things that we could do to help us be our best selves. So I'm excited to launch into this this interview. But before I do, I do just want to give a couple quick little updates. My audio book is now out. Meditations from the Mount, the commentary. It is now on Audible. And what I love about this is it's not just the book, but it it is also my musical project, The Songs from the Mount. So there's 16 songs that come from, uh, that I have written that come straight from the Sermon on the Mount. And these chapters correlate with those songs. And now you don't have to go to Spotify to listen to the songs and then, uh, you know, pull up the, the book, you can have it all together on Audible, the songs and the commentary. So go and check that out and, and please you know let me know what you think by, by rating that and, and letting people know about that. Uh, to me, Jesus's Sermon on the Mount is still such words of wisdom. And for all of us who are still trying to figure it out, we should try those words sometimes. Just try them on for size. Whether or not we consider ourselves a Christian, there are life, there is life in these words and teachings, and I think it's worth doing. And let me do a little side plug for my band Seeking Gravity. We now have two singles out, so if you have not checked out Soul Show, you should check out Soul Show by Seeking Gravity. And now we have our second single out, Warfare Within. So this is a a band that I am so excited about because it's all original music, uh, rock music, and it has a lot of spiritual depth in in the lyrics. um, And uh, it connects with me personally. And it's also just the the type of music um, that I grew up to. And so I, I love listening to this and, and making type this type of music and playing this type of music live. And so we're going to be doing some more of that too. So we'll def- I'll definitely try to keep y'all up to date about things like that. So here is my conversation with Brandon Doty, professional runner, also a running coach who you should check out uh, his website if you are even remotely interested in running and learning how to run, you should check that out. Here is Brandon. Man, it's good to see you. I know, it's been too long. Definitely. So where, where, where are you located now? I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Not too far from the Grand Canyon and Phoenix and yeah. Dude. 
That's awesome. Well, next time we take a road trip and check out those sweet sites, we're going to have to hit you up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got an extra bedroom here, guest room. So yeah, absolutely. That's awesome, man. Well, I definitely miss, miss having you around uh, the Blowing Rock area, but uh, it's been cool to kind of keep up with you from a distance uh, through social media and all that. Um, so for, for the podcast, I'd love to just start with like maybe sharing a little bit about your story, your, your origins. I mean, I, I would say it's a pretty rare thing for somebody to, uh, to be a professional runner for running to be kind of their, their main thing that they've done their whole life um, is, I guess, when did you first like discover that you were good at running or that you were fast? I mean, is that like you like walked and then you're like, I think I'd rather run as a, as like a kid. <laughs> How'd that happen? Well, I actually didn't, I got, I always knew I was one of the faster guys when we played just like sports, but like nothing crazy, like, you know, football, baseball, whatever it is. And I always, when we did suicides, basketball, like whatever it was, I was always like, the first or one of the first guys. So I was just faster, but I was also really short. So I was like, you win some, you lose some, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't do my first race until, um, sixth grade, uh, the first cross country meet. Um, and the only reason I ran cross country was because you weren't allowed to play football until seventh grade in West Virginia. So, um, I just kind of got lucky and, our team went undefeated that year. I was our fifth man. So I wasn't even like sixth through eighth grade and I was the fifth man and we went undefeated and it was just a great experience. And I kind of just stuck with it after that. Nice. So that's so middle school, you figured out you could do some running, but then, um, I'd say by my eighth grade year, I realized I was especially talented. That was kind of when, I started standing out a little bit more. Uh, I pretty much won every single race I ran. Um, and then like the high school coach was, would come to the meets and talk to me. And that wasn't super normal for, for our middle school to even with how good we were to have the high school coach come in, you know, to watch the races. So that's when I kind of started figuring out, I was pretty good at it. Um, I didn't really become dedicated and start pursuing it until probably like my junior year of high school. I, I just, I worked hard. But, you know, I didn't do a ton over the summer. Like, I didn't do a ton of extra training. Um, but then my junior year, I started, you know, getting up two to three times a week before school so I could double, you know, get up at the crack of dawn, 5.30 in the morning kind of thing. And uh, I'd, you know, run 80 miles a week over the summer. Um, and that's when I really started, you know, trying to pursue it as not just something I was good at, but something I could Maybe, maybe not professionally at that point, but make, make enough, like get a scholarship to go to college. Right. Like, so that was, that was the financial uh, aspect at that point in my running. And then I'd say again, in my junior year of college is when I realized, oh, wow, um, I could make a living off of this. Not much because professional runners don't make much, but uh, enough to get by. So have you always been a competitive natured person? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I'd say I'm, I'm a very good sport. Like I'm a good loser, which is something that running teaches you quickly. Cause you lose 99% of the races, even if it was, it was a win, like even if it was a good race. Um, so I I'd say I'm a good sport, but definitely very competitive on the inside. I'm, I'm dying if I'm, if I'm losing, but I, I try not to, I try not to show it just for the, you know, fun cornhole games or <laughs> a game of monopoly or something. <laughs> Where do you, where do you think that came from? I mean, does, do you have siblings? Yeah, I'm the oldest. Uh, I have a, a little sister in the middle and then my youngest, uh, youngest brother. So uh, I'm the oldest and yeah, I mean, our whole family's always been competitive with games. We played a lot of card games growing up, uh, a game called spades. It was a four person game. So we would all four play all the time and it got pretty heated. So it definitely runs in the family. Nice. Well, um, just share, share a little bit about your journey. I, mean, I know if you've had a lot of ups and downs, you've um, had some injuries, some surgeries, basically things that other people have said, well, you pretty much need to quit and you haven't quit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it's, sports are tough. I mean, everybody knows that a lot of, a lot of highs and lows, um, uh, which is why I do it. You know, I, you know, you're just always chasing the high. Um, 
I was super blessed early on. Like I, like we were talking about in high school and college, I was super healthy. I just got better every year. I didn't really like, I had the struggles of working hard and having tough competition, but like nothing, nothing like I've had since I've gone pro I, the first seven or eight years of my serious running career. I didn't realize how hard running was until the injuries started mounting. Um, and in, so I graduated in 2016 that, that year I was the top returner in the entire nation for the steeplechase. I was supposed to sign a big contract. I was supposed to win nationals, you know, like just go through the motions kind of thing. And the, the world is mine. And I ended up stress fracturing both my feet, um, ended up not having all the opportunities that I would have had if I would have raced and ran, you know, one or ran well at nationals, uh, got an opportunity in blowing rock, which is where we met, uh, by zap the professional running team there and i was super blessed to have that that opportunity and the injuries honestly just didn't stop there um the next year 2017 i started having chronic achilles issues um waited about a year and a half till the summer of 2018 to get surgery on it uh, just because that's something you want to avoid at all costs um and you're never you know really expected to be back to 100 percent after a Haglund's deformity surgery which is what i had on my achilles um which is basically for those that don't know, it's they detach the Achilles from the base and then shave off part of the bone on the heel because the heel is protruding into the Achilles and then they reattach the Achilles. So it's a pretty invasive surgery and it you really can't run for up to a half a year after that, which means it'll take another year plus to get back to even, you know, remotely high level shape that, you know, that I was in at the time. Uh, so I got that surgery a year later, we found out that it was kind of botched. Uh, they cut too much bone off. They cut over an inch off instead of like a centimeter. Uh, it grew back protruding the Achilles and I needed the same surgery on my right Achilles again, which is something that no one's ever come back from and run at a high level. Um, and even, I mean, I, this time I went to the best surgeon in the U S Dr. Saxena. And he even told me, he was like, listen, like a lot of people can come back for marathons and road races from this, but the idea of doing a steeplechase because it's faster, it's on the track and it's a lot of jumping and pounding on your Achilles. It just, it's not going to happen. So you might need to rethink some goals. And that was the summer of 2019 when I got that surgery. Um, and then going into 2020, I was just slowly getting back into shape. I was not going to quite make the cut for getting in fast enough shape to, to, um, have my bid for an Olympic team and then tragedy tragedy hit with the uh, COVID outbreak. And um, as tough as it was for a lot of families and a lot of people, it was a blessing for me in my running career because the Olympic trials got pushed back a year, ended up getting in really good shape, running the Olympic trials mark, being one of 30 guys or less that had a shot at making the Olympic team. And um, this couple months ago was the Olympic trial steeplechase race, the preliminaries and didn't quite go according to plan. I did not make the final, but I mean, I, I made the full comeback. I ran a top 10 us time, a top 30 world time at the time. And yeah, I'm just excited to be back. And, um, hopefully next year I can actually make my bid for a world team because worlds are in Eugene. So in the United States next year. So you, so you came, not only did you have to come back from one surgery, which took over a year of recovery, that surgery wasn't even done well. You had to have the whole, have that whole surgery again, which took another year or more to sort of recover from. And yet you still competed. I mean, even just to be able to show up for that race, you had to like make a certain what, uh, cut off yeah, the time. which so i think i think 25 guys ended up running the time you had to run in the u.s um and then those 25 guys are the ones that have a shot at making the top three olympic team that gets to go to tokyo so you ended up basically becoming one of the top 10 fastest people in the united states this year, yeah, the, the time I ran uh, at the time of it was, I think it was the 33rd fastest time in the world and the ninth or 10th fastest time in the U.S. Um, 
obviously the further you get into the year, the more fast times uh, people run now it's no, now it's not even close, but, uh, back in, uh, back in May, it was a, it was a good time. <laughs> uh, yeah. So watching the Olympics is so exciting and, you know, everybody really gets into it and it is crazy to see, um, world records just keep getting beaten every year. I, I wonder like how, how is that even possible that the world record keep that, that, that we just keep getting faster and faster? Is it, I mean, are, are we evolving as humans or is it like, is there like more technology? Yeah, I think for the most part, it's especially right now for running, it's technology. Um, and it's a lot of it's knowledge. It's knowing how to train smarter and better for certain events, knowing the, the proper nutrition, like knowing how much protein to take, when to take it, just a bunch of little things that add up. Uh, but right now in running, there's a, it's, it's super, uh, controversial with shoes. Um, Nike last year came out with this pair of spikes that like for non-runners, it basically feels like you're on a trampoline when you're running, like it's ridiculous. So, so then the USA track and field and the IAAF, uh, which is like the world association, uh, like committee for running had to start making um, laws and rules about what can and can't go in shoes and how big the heel to toe drop can be and uh, how, you know, quote unquote bouncy they can be with the, the foam combined with a carbon fiber plate, which is what made it so bouncy. So it's the technology has been crazy. Uh, and a lot of other companies are catching up at this point. Most of them have, but all the way up until the trials, it was, it was intense. Um, I ended up getting my contract frozen with Under Armour uh, because I didn't want to wear a pair of Under Armour shoes because at the time they didn't have the same technology that the Nikes and the Asics and the Hoka's of the world had. Um, so it was it was tough for a lot of athletes and a lot of shoe companies making decisions like, are we going to let our athletes race in shoes that aren't ours so they have a better shot at making a team? Or are we going to put our foot down? And it was a pretty intense last year of just chaos with, with, uh, technology. So yeah, <laughs> long story short, my answer. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's wild. Well, yeah. Um, you, you definitely went into something I was going to ask you about which is, you know, one of the things I, I just kind of noticed and learned from, from you when, when you were in blowing rock, even is, you know, when you're running professionally, um, your whole lifestyle is, is really affected because not only do you have to train hard, you have to rest hard or rest well. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it seems like a, yeah, it's yeah. a whole lifestyle and down to your diet. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that is really interesting to me is, and I've, I've just, I've seen you kind of write about this on your social media posts is, and people don't think about this, but I think Simone Biles has actually yeah. really highlighted this is it's not just about physical fitness, but it's about mental uh, uh, health. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I think uh, a lot of, a lot of athletes would say it's 50% mental and 50% physical in sports and especially running. Like, I mean, you've done a ton of like half, half marathons and hard, you know, 10 Ks and five Ks. I'm sure that you can, even you can be like, yeah, it's, there's a lot of mental aspects to it, you know, making decisions on, on paces and hanging on. And I can do this right now, but I don't think I can do it for a mile. So do I back off? Um, there's so many different things. And then the pressure that gets surmounted on top of that uh, with the, these, you know, world stages that national stages that we race at, it, it gets even harder. And I think if you're not on top of it, um, it can really get the best of you. And that's kind of what happened with Simone. I think um, you don't really realize it until it's too late. And she just kind of like mentally broke. And she's, that's why she had to back out because she was scared she was going to ruin uh, a medal for her, the U S team. And she's the best, you know, gymnastics athlete in the entire world. And she's been that. So, you know, mental, the mental aspect has a lot to do with it. And most people don't spend if it's 50, 50, you know, we're not spending 50% of the time working on the mental side, right? Like we're spending 99 on the physical side. Uh, so for me, I, 
um, my uh, injuries ended up being a blessing in disguise because it kind of helped me get my head right with meditation. Uh, for me, a lot of it's reading the Bible every day. Like that just keeps me grounded. Um, I write down three things I'm grateful for every, every morning when I wake up to kind of get me started on the, on the right foot, just really, really little things, um, getting off of your phone and just having a moment of silence, which, you know, like people call it meditation and it gets a, it gets a bad connotation, but, um, you know, just, it's just sitting quietly with your thoughts, which in today's world, we don't do right. Like you have five minutes to yourself, you pull up Instagram, you're in an awkward conversation with somebody, you get your phone out and pretend like you're texting someone like there's no like silence is the enemy when it's sh you should be able to be silent with your thoughts and um that's especially important uh in, in sport so you feel like these injuries actually helped you learn how to maybe have more practices for your mental health yeah i just didn't spend much time on it um i just never spent any time working on it because you're just like oh yeah mentally tough like I show up when it counts most, you know, and it's not always just about that. Uh, it's, a, it's just kind of about the way you go into races and, uh, you know, running professionally was a dream I've always had, but once it becomes reality, it's hard to enjoy it as much because you're getting paid to do it, which means you have to do it. So instead of like, I'm going to go out for a run today, it's like, I have to do 12 miles today at this pace, you know? So it, it, it really, staying on top of the mental side helps you appreciate things more and, and enjoy the thing that you love doing most. Like it, instead of something that's supposed to be a stress reliever running for most people, it becomes a stressor if it's, a, if it's your you know profession and uh, it just makes things a little bit harder. So yeah, I mean, my, my injuries made me hit rock bottom mentally and I was super depressed. I got to the point where I was suicidal um, and yeah, I, I made some really bad decisions for a long period of time and I had to climb my way out of that. And a lot of that was, uh, you know, reading the Bible, these three things that I'm grateful for every morning to get me started on the right foot, these moments of silence and meditation, like 20 minutes a day, every day I meditate and it's, it's done wonders for my mental health and well-being. And, and now it's starting to show in sport, you know, it's starting to show in my, in my athletics as well, which is a, a nice bonus to just being mentally healthier. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can imagine if, if you, even as like a kid realize like I'm fast, I'm a good runner and you continue to get better and better and better. And then, you know, your whole, you know, career and path is, is running. And all of a sudden you like, can't even walk <laughs> because of these injuries. It's, it's almost like a, I imagine that was a pretty much like a life crisis of like an identity crisis. Like who, who oh. am I and what good am I? What worth and value do I have? You get wrapped up in achievements and glory and all Americans and like, you know, anything to just get your name out there. Like just the glory, the whatever it is, like the attention is what it is. And that's what you get caught up in. And once that goes away, and like you said, like that was my identity, like running was who I from. I was one of the best runners in the history of West Virginia going into college. I became the best runner in Oklahoma history from a lot of aspects. Like I just kept getting to a higher stage and that made me drown further and further into the running, like it being my identity and uh, being able to take a step back from that. Um, it first of all helps with bad races. If I have a bad race, I'm not distraught now. Like my life isn't over. I'm just like, all right, let's move on. Get your head back up. Like take 24 hours to mope about it and then wake up the next day and be like, all right, let's figure this out. I got a great relationship, you know, like I'm healthy. I'm, I've got a great dog. I've got a great home. You know, I got so many things going for me. One bad race isn't the end of the world. So it's, it just kind of puts it in perspective for sure. At least for me, it did. Yeah, that, that, that makes total sense. And I, and I imagine that's, it's probably more helpful for when you're listing the three things that you're grateful for. One of them isn't that you can run fast. Yeah. I mean, exactly. that, that might be one sometimes, but if that's the only thing, yeah, as soon as, you know, you're, you have an injury, it's like, well, that, that you don't have that leg to stand on literally and yeah. metaphorically. Yeah all your eggs in one basket and that means they all crack at the same time right so <laughs> you don't have any more eggs but I mean I'm sure you can relate with with music you know like I'm sure at times it's just like it 
almost feels like more of a chore than it does something that you love. And like, it's your, it's your biggest passion. Right. So like you have to take a step back and be like, I'm writing songs, I'm singing, like I'm doing what I love and I, you know, kind of need to wake up and realize that. Right. Yeah. So a big part of it is like keeping the joy yeah, and, and remembering what, what about it is enjoyable. And I can imagine, um, I had a similar thing when I, when I actually, I, I pretty much self-taught on guitar. I had other people show me some things, but there was one time in my life where I was taking, I was doing classical guitar for a, a college degree and I had to like perform, you know, with the, with the classical guitar. And that was the one time when it felt like work yeah. rather than like, I could just pick up and play whatever I wanted to. Like I had to like play some things that I didn't want to, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I could, I could, I could understand when running goes from being the thing you love to being your job. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely have to uh, figure out how to keep your, keep your head in check. Well, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in your meditation practices because, you know, I, th- I feel like in so many aspects of life and in our world, more and more people are realizing just how important it is to have some practices like that. What, how did you start doing that? Like, did, did was there anything that kind of helped you figure out how to get started doing things? Yeah, I mean, I got to the point where I had to. I was in such a dark place. And like, like I said, I, I hit rock bottom so hard. And <laughs> once you hit rock bottom and there's nowhere else to go, like you're just like, something has to change. I have to do something. You know, you listen to a podcast and they say something about meditation. So you download an app and you try it. And that app for me was Headspace. Um, at this point, uh, it's gotten crazy expensive, but you can use other apps like Calm or something else. Um, but I think they still have like free trials. And what I did was I got, I got the app for a year. Um, I bought whatever, what, whatever it cost at the time. And I meditated for basically a year on the app. And now I basically just set my watch to 20 minute, 20 minute timer that just vibrates when it's over. And I just sit quietly with my thoughts and almost, uh, imagine like a, a canoe and like letting whatever thought it was float down the river. And like, you have a certain spatial like perspective and you watch this canoe float down, just let that thought go. You can think on it. If it, if it's a slower current, that's fine but let it keep moving. And once it's out of the picture, move on to the next one. And maybe this one goes wide faster. And it's just kind of like, that's how you keep on top of not just getting caught in one thing with meditation. It, you can, uh, that's how I kind of keep the ball rolling and keep my mind moving and stay focused and just kind of being in the moment. But um, yeah, I mean, it built, you know, I didn't just sit down one day and say, I'm going to meditate for an hour quietly with my thoughts to myself. I, I would never be able to do that. It was two minutes, you know, it was three minutes and you work, you work your way up just like anything. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's in the same way that you have to, you can't just, ju- you know, stay, say tomorrow I'm going to run a marathon. <laughs> yeah. You have to figure out, you know, you have to take these steps to, to build up to that. Uh, I guess that's the same is true with our mental health and our mental uh, practices of, yeah, just start real, real small. And um, yeah, and the way it it seems like there's not necessarily a way to fail at it because the, 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 the goal is not necessarily like perfection. Like you, you're not going to ever have like a completely clear mind, but it's actually better to just be aware and then like and it's like the 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 act of actually noticing a thought and then realizing you're having it and then being able to maybe have a different thought like that's part of it you hit the nail on the head the goal isn't to like people misinterpret meditation like the goal is to get rid of my anger or to like not be sad anymore or to always be happy the goal is to create space when you feel that anger emotion and know that it's not you and that emotion doesn't define you as a person and it's okay that you feel it and everybody feels it and then when the happiness comes enjoy it stay in it like prolong it as long as you can and know that it's going to go away like happiness isn't uh, it's not a destination it's not something you're trying to get it's more of a, a wave it, it ebbs and flows and you just kind of have to roll with it and it's 
you're never always going to be happy. And if you are, then you actually don't know what happiness is because it becomes the normal state. Right. So without the valleys, we can't enjoy the the peaks and um, that, like, like you said, like just creating space from, from certain thoughts and emotions. That's, that's what it's about. It's not about ignoring them or burying them or getting rid of them. Cause that's never going to happen. Man, that's, without the yeah without the valleys the below would be no the peaks that's that kind of that definitely like fits with your story i mean you if if i i feel like if you just had always had you know success <laughs> your whole life like you'd probably wouldn't be super have, bored yeah i wouldn't appreciate it i really i stopped appreciating it when i was at the top of my game my last two years of college it became more of a fear of failure than like an enjoyment to succeed or an enjoyment just doing it and like now, even though I'm, I'm like not even running as well as I did then I'm enjoying it more like, and I'm enjoying every day the the runs where I don't want to go on, but I'm just appreciating being able to being able to run healthy. Like I, there was a time where I would just pray and pray and pray for a pain-free run. I went four years without a pain-free run and that's what I was getting paid to do. So like, it just really you know, like you said, I've, I've seen a lot of valleys, but that also means that I've been able to appreciate a lot of the peaks. So, I mean, I, I feel blessed and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. So. Man, that's awesome. Well, um, I don't know if I even told you this, but the name of my podcast is still figuring it out. And so the, the, the whole idea is that like, we never like get to the point where we arrive and we like, we know it all. So I imagine oh. that that's like true. Like I imagine you're probably still like learning better ways, like better training patterns and, you know, better, like, and how, what, what is, you know, tell, tell me like about how you are continuing to learn now and, and you're helping other people learn. Um, like, are you, I'm, is it like constantly, is it experimentation or is it like reading, reading other articles and books or like um yeah, yeah. All I, know the it's, I know that this a, it's a learning community for you i'm sure no absolutely i mean there's so many a- like running is simple but it's not easy there's so many aspects to it especially in the pro world and i mean weightlifting, speed work plyometrics like volume um like there's so many things nutrition and sleep and yeah, there's new things coming out every day. And this is also a perfect opportunity to plug my coaching. So I'm going to jump on that. Uh, I have a online coaching, a private online coaching business called Dart, Dowdy's American Running Team. Uh, it's in the link in my bio uh, on Instagram, Dodes uh, underscore XC. Um, and yeah, it's that's that's where most of my learning has come from. Um, my my failures as an athlete so I can help others succeed and not make the same mistakes that I do. So a lot of it's trial and error. Um, and you know, I, I do a lot of marathon coaching, even though I've never run a marathon. So I've learned so much over the last three years of, of coaching that. And, um, a lot, a lot of that is just hydration during the race. You know, that, that the amount I've learned about hydration in a marathon, like during a marathon is you know, I had no idea, even when I was a pro runner to start, you know, and it's just, there's so many little aspects that you can continue to learn and grow. And yeah, just read books, trial and error. And, and, you know, you slowly figure out what works because everybody's different and everyone needs their own little individualization in training. And that's, that's what I try to give as a coach. And that's what I try to do for myself as an athlete. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I was hoping you would do that because I knew (laughs) you were, um, you know, not just using your knowledge for yourself these days, but uh, helping other people, you know, learn how to, how to get the best out of their bodies and out of their lives. You know, um, I actually, over quarantine, I I started running even more uh, because it really was a way to kind of get out of the house and clear my head. And, um, and so I'm still actually just signed up for another half marathon. Um, And so, I've, I've been a little discouraged though, cause I just came back from the beach and I feel like after vacation, you know, you, that first run, you're like, do I even remember how to do this? It's, it feels so it's awkward. And like, you're like, am I even moving my arms right with the legs? Like, no, I, I still feel that I'm in the middle of a two week break and I guarantee my first run back, I'm going to be like, man, I lost all my fitness. It's all gone, but it, 
it never really leaves. It just feels like it for a little while. Every run you, every run you've ever done will help you get to this, this half marathon. So you got this. Thanks, man. That's, that's good to hear. Every run you ever do will actually does help in, in the long yeah. run. Yeah, I know. Cause then I hear these things like, don't ever go more than like a couple of days without running. And then I hear, then it's like, but then Brandon, <laughs> this one of the fastest runners in the world went how many how many years like where you couldn't even put weight on your foot <laughs> yeah. yeah you can always come back um I mean it just takes a while you know it I it took probably took I mean I took probably four years of running for like half of the days um just with the surgeries and stuff and it took about two years to get back to my to my fitness level but if you look back to get to where I was took what 12 years you know like of basically from high school and college and beyond to get that fit. And then I start from scratch and it takes two years and I start from scratch, scratch. Like, you know, when you take a month off, you're not starting from scratch. It just feels like it. So you're fine. Yeah. It, it all, everything you've ever done builds the base for where you're at now. And you just need to get the body reaccustomed to running. So. Well, I'm definitely not competitive as far as with other people, but I am, uh, com- competing against my former self. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at now. Uh, with just Every, to... No matter what level they run on. I mean, that's all you can control is yourself. So why try to control people around you? You can compete with them and to better yourself. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's you versus you. And you're just trying to find out what you can do relative to what you've done. So. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. And I, and I love the idea that failure is not always something to be avoided, but often something to, to learn from. Oh yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I mean, there's some, that's my favorite thing about running, uh, especially coaching is the failure that comes with it. Um, like you just grow so much as a person. It's just, it's this controlled environment where you don't have to, you don't have to have a tragedy in your life happen to actually grow as a human with your character as as a person like you can you can just fail in running which like in your world that's everything at the time and it feels like the end of the world but at the end of the day it's just running and you can you can grow and develop and learn so much about yourself just just through like for me the the trials I've been through just in the sport I mean it's just running but I've like I fought back so many times and I've learned so much about myself and my resilience and what I'm capable of. And it just makes you more confident and more in tune with yourself. And I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what life's about? Like learning and growing as a person and helping others learn and grow. And for me, running helps me do that for myself and others. And that's just like, that's all you can ask for. Well said. I don't, I don't think there's anything. (laughs) <laughs> like that's like the perfect way to to end this conversation but um of course i know there's we could we could go on and on um but thank thank you so much i i guess one last question is like what is it like for you now watching the olympics i mean do you do you know some of the runners like are you also a little bit like envious of them or like what's going on in your mind so yeah, a lot's going on in my mind um but to put it in perspective, in, in 2016, uh, I was hoping to be in shape to make my first team and ended up having those two stress fractures. And and watching the Olympics, I almost couldn't do. I was just like, and, you know, especially the steeplechase. Uh, and, but I didn't really know anybody in, in the races. And I, I was just out of college, so I just didn't really know any of the pros. Coming into this year, I at least made it to the trials and didn't actually make the Olympic team. Um, when, you know, on paper, when you're a 12-year-old kid, 2020, you know, was the, that was the best chance kind of thing, quote unquote. Um, so I, I teared up during the opening ceremony when I watched that, it was pretty tough, just, you know, you know, 10, 15 years of, you know, a goal, a dream doesn't, doesn't come true. And, you know, I have three years to the next Olympics, so I have an opportunity, but the silver lining is the guys in the race. I know all of them. In fact, just on the American team, I have a better record against two of the three guys. Like I beat them more than they beat me, two of the three guys that made the team. So like, I know I'm good enough to get there. And like, I mean, there's guys 
like, like there's a British steepler that lived with me for three months to train up in Flagstaff. So I know these guys super well and I've trained with them. And that's a big step that I made from 2016 to 2021 now. So, um, yeah, I, it's long story short, it is hard to watch, but worth it. Um, and maybe in three years, I'll actually be, uh, in Paris, which is where the 2024 Olympics are. <laughs> Well, you definitely have at least one fan right here rooting for you. And whether or not you make it to the Olympics, uh, I still look to you as uh, a hero of mine, not just because of your running, but because um, because you you teach me something about life in general, about what it takes to be better and better, uh, to grow, to have to have discipline, but also to take uh, care of yourself, to rest to give yourself what you need, um, but also push yourself hard. Um, and that, that resilience is, is you know, inspiring in, in so many aspects of, of life. And so I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm blessed to count you as a friend and I really appreciate you uh, taking some time to, to catch up and, and share your story and, and inspire um, anybody who's, who's listening to, to the Still Figuring Out podcast. And we'll definitely have to keep the conversation going so we can get yeah. with, um, yeah, three years, Paris, here we come. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on. It's, uh, it's been fun. Definitely, man. I appreciate you. I'm still figuring it out, living with these doubts and beliefs, how to breathe, how to be the only me. Still figuring it out, how to live it out, not just dream, but to see what this love is all about. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening in as much as I enjoyed talking with Brandon. He really does have some practical tips to start the day being grateful, to, to not wrap our identity around any one aspect of ourselves that we're really good at, because that could go away and we'll be left asking, who are we? And so I hope you know today that you are a beloved child of God. That no matter your ability level, you have uh, a remarkable uh, giftedness of just being you. And that is worth showing up for. And it's worth uh, being engaged in the world because the world needs people like you. So much of what he was talking about uh, reminds me of what I heard Simone Biles saying that her main goal in life is not just to be an Olympian, but to be the best version of herself, to take care of herself. And so that is to be commended. It is brave. And for as much criticism as she's had, it is something to be followed. And I, I thank Simone for her courage. I thank Brandon for him also pointing to this same idea that we are we are worth investing in you are worth investing in yourself and not killing yourself for some uh, achievement no matter how big the audience so please check out brandon's website i will have that uh, in the show notes and you know hit him up on social media keep up with what he's doing continue to follow his journey uh, as he will continue to compete and possibly be in paris uh, in only three years which is amazing so we're so thankful for brandon we are rooting him on and we are inspired by him to uh, for us to continue to keep figuring out how to be the best version of ourselves I'm